Welcome! My name is Kaspar van Lissa and I'm the lead author of the Workflow for Open Reproducible Code in Science, also known as WORKS. The paper for this workflow was recently published in Data Science and the link is on the screen. Today I will be telling you about how this workflow can help you meet the goals of open science. Now before I can explain how our workflow helps meet the goals of open science, we first have to define what open science is. And that is not a trivial matter because a lot of people have discussed this issue from different perspectives. One nice quote that summarizes open science very well is, open science is just good science by the late Dr. Jonathan Tennant. The idea behind this is that transparency is intrinsic to the scientific method. If we want other researchers to take our results seriously, we have to demonstrate that the results are reliable and replicable and the best way to do this is to make our methods as transparent as possible. There are also several formal definitions, such as, for example, the top guidelines, which were developed by Nosek and colleagues, and the FAIR principles by Wilkinson and colleagues. The workflow that I'm introducing today is designed to meet seven out of eight of the top guidelines. And those guidelines are comprehensive citation of all of the literature, data, materials, and methods that your study builds upon, Two, sharing your original data, if possible. Three, sharing the code required to reproduce analyses, in other words, the code that is necessary to get from your data to your published results. Four, sharing newly developed research materials, if applicable. Five, sharing the details of the design of your study and the analysis, and this also relates to the third point of sharing code. And six, pre-registering studies before data collection. This is primarily relevant when you intend to test hypotheses in your research. And finally, seven, pre-registering the analysis plan. And this can be as detailed as pre-registering the entire analysis code before even collecting the data. The eighth criterion of the top guidelines is less relevant to openness and reproducibility, as pointed out by the original authors. And this is replicating published results. Replication is just good practice, so we are sure that published findings are reliable. Now, when we strive to meet these top guidelines, we can do so in a FAIR manner. And FAIR is an acronym which relates to how findable our data are, whether they are accessible online for humans and machines, whether they are interoperable, which means that they can use for different purposes than the one you originally envisioned, and four, reusability that means that you have provided not only the means to access the data but also a legal license for others to do so now these fair principles were originally devised with regards to sharing data but recently many authors have commented that they are equally applicable to other forms of research output thus in the workflow for open reproducible code in science we try to make all of our research output shareable in a fair manner why is open science important? Well, there are different perspectives on this question. We can go as far back as to the 1950s, when Theodore Sterling already commented that it's possible that only the studies that find significant p-values end up being published. Inevitably, some of these findings are bound to be type 1 errors, false positive findings, or spurious findings. And if a literature ends up focusing primarily on significant results, there might be less focus on replication and spurious findings like these end up going uncorrected. Now this diminishes the reliability of the literature and ultimately limits its usefulness for policy and for clinical practice. But recently there has been renewed interest in the move towards open science. And I've summarized the reasons that people give into the four points on the slide. The first point is that there is elevated concern about scientific fraud. There have been several noteworthy cases, for example, the case of Diederik Stapel in my country of the Netherlands. And this was a very famous researcher who, as it turned out, had been fraudulently inventing his test statistics and even entire data sets going back decades. If we embrace open science practices, such blatant cases of fraud are more likely to come to light. Of course, such cases are very extreme and only a very small percentage of researchers is likely to engage in willful fraud. But what about questionable research practices? These can become quite deeply embedded in a field, giving newcomers the sense that this is just how we do things, even when some of those things might be questionable 
if you look closer. There are many different questionable research practices, but one salient example is harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. This means that people begin conducting a study and begin analyzing their data without a very clear idea in mind of what hypotheses they want to test. Then they look for some interesting results, and once they find those, then they write an introduction, writing hypotheses in line with the results that they've already observed. Now this again is a recipe for spurious findings, and as such should be considered a questionable research practice. Open science practices make people aware of such questionable research practices and also prevent them from occurring in the first place. The third point is p-hacking or the p-ritual, a term coined by Gigerenser. This is basically the idea that the only findings worth talking about are the ones with significant p-values. This is not true. It is of course equally informative to find that a certain hypothesis is not true as to find that a hypothesis is true. And the fourth point is the so-called replication crisis. The concern that as many as 70% of the findings in psychology cannot be replicated by independent researchers. This suggests that in fact our literature might be permeated with spurious findings and open science would be a good solution to reduce their prevalence. But all this sounds quite negative. Does that mean that we should consider open science to be the punishment that we pay for engaging in bad science? Maybe not. We can also see open science as a paradigm shift, because open science creates opportunities to make research more reliable, more cumulative, because in the face of complete transparency it is easier to build upon the work of your predecessors, more collaborative, because if all collaborators have access to all materials it is easier to work together, and finally more inclusive, and this is a very important point. Not every university around the world has access to the same journals, has access to the same participant pools, has access to the same methods. If we make all of these different phases in the research process transparent, then researchers can contribute to the scientific process regardless of their means. And there is increasing attention for this kind of inclusivity in the scientific field. Given the recent global pandemic, I think it's also worth pointing out that open science really shines when the stakes are high. For example, in this screenshot you can see that Nature has published a collection of all open data sets pertaining to the coronavirus. And here's a news article, also published in Nature, which comments on the retraction of high-profile papers about the coronavirus. At first sight this looks like a negative thing, because these publications were found to be faulty. But on further reflection we might realize that only thanks to open science does it become possible for the literature to self-correct at such a rapid pace that papers can be retracted within as little as a year. In other words, thanks to open science, we can eliminate erroneous findings more rapidly. And this is a screenshot that will be meaningless for most English-speaking viewers, but this is a newspaper article that I published in the largest Dutch newspaper emphasizing the importance of sharing data and code in order to, for example, develop exit strategies so that we can move out of the coronavirus restrictions in a safe and reliable manner. Perhaps I've managed to convince you about the importance of open science, or maybe you were already convinced when you joined this lecture. But for many people, open science can be also quite challenging. Where do you start when you want to practice open science in your own research? What new tools do you need to learn? And what workflow is right for you? I will argue that WORKS, the workflow for open reproducible code in science, is a good starting point. This is a standardized workflow with a low threshold, which means that it's easy to start using it, and also a high ceiling, which means that you can make it as elaborate as you want and as necessary for your personal needs. WORKS is based on conceptual and platform-independent principles of open science, which we discuss in the paper. But there is also a so-called one-click solution for people who conduct their research in R, and that is an R package that implements the advice that we give in the paper. This package uses defaults based on best practices, and we've involved a whole team of international experts from different fields to make sure that these defaults are sensible. 
Works should be compatible with most existing journal and university requirements and with other workflows, and it is flexible enough to account for specific requirements not yet integrated in a standard workflow. In other words, what Works tries to achieve is to bring down the learning curve to make it easier for everybody to start adopting open science principles. Works is based on three fundamental tools that I would like to introduce to you. The first is dynamic document generation. The second is version control. And the third is dependency management. What is dynamic document generation? You might be familiar with a way of working where you conduct your analyses in one piece of software and write your paper in a different piece of software and copy paste your results into the paper. Dynamic document generation offers an alternative. It allows you to write a paper that consists of both text and code. That means that all of your results, figures and tables are automatically generated when you compile the paper. The paper is also automatically formatted. For example, if you like to write in the APA style, your paper can be automatically formatted in APA style and then includes all of your citations. Dynamic document generation is important because it saves you time from having to copy paste all of your output each time you update your analyses. It also saves you time when it comes to formatting your paper. And moreover, it eliminates a lot of human error in copying results. I'm willing to share something personal, which is that one of the reasons that I became so deeply involved in reproducible code is because I always made mistakes when copy pasting my results into my papers. And at some point I thought there has to be an easier way to do this that is more reliable. And the answer turned out to be dynamic document generation. Another benefit of this method is that when you have to revise a paper, all of your results will be automatically updated. So for example, if you have a very perfectionist supervisor or a demanding reviewer, you might have to go through many revisions. And thanks to dynamic document generation, you just have to click a button in order to update all of your results throughout the paper. Finally, and most importantly in the context of open science, is that a paper generated using this method is reproducible by default. You just click a button and all of the analyses in the document are reproduced. That also means that you can check whether all of your analyses are reproducible before even publishing the paper. And then you have peace of mind knowing that anybody could reproduce your work. The R implementation of works uses a specific type of dynamic document known as R Markdown. That is a blend between R code and markdown formatting. If you haven't seen this before, this is what it looks like. We see here a short excerpt out of a default template. Let's take a moment to look at this code. On the first line, we see a header, which is simply indicated by two pound signs. The section is called data analysis. Then there is some prose and inserted in the prose, we see a code for a function called site R. This is gonna automatically cite all of the R packages that we've used. Then on line 99, we see the beginning of a more serious piece of code. And when rendered, this code gives us the picture displayed in a preview below. So what happens when I render this entire document? Well, then we see this, we see a nice APA style. We see that the references have been added, including the reference to works. And we don't see the figures because they've been placed at the bottom of the document in line with APA style. Very nice. So this is just a quick preview, but our markdown can do this for your entire paper. The second tool that I would like to introduce is version control, specifically using Git. You're probably already using some kind of version control, but it might be informal. For example, as illustrated in the comic on the screen, maybe you have many different file types that are copies in which something has been changed about your manuscript. This is a little bit unorganized. Even if you have mastered the art of file naming, this is a little bit of a messy system. Some people use Dropbox for their version control and some people use track changes in Word, but there is 
a method that is much more amenable to scientific research, and that is Git. Git is basically track changes on steroids. It records every single change to your project from the beginning of the project history. That means that if something breaks, or if you want to go back to a previous version of the writing, you can always step back however far you want. This method also facilitates collaboration and experimentation, because other people can submit changes and because you can go off on a tangent. And if you don't like where you end up, you just go back a few steps into the project history. I will briefly explain how Git works. As you write, Git tracks the changes to all of your text-based files on a line-by-line -line basis. When you want to save the current state of your project, you have to do three things. First, you have to add the files to your repository that you want to track. Second, you have to commit the changes that you've made to those files. And third, you have to push all of those commits to a remote repository. That can be either a private backup on the internet or a public online supplement for your research. Now, the R implementation of works has integrated all three of these steps into a single command. If you use works, you can just use the function git update to add your files, commit the changes and push them to a remote repository. So this is basically a quick save for Git. I also want to introduce GitHub. GitHub enhances the functionality of Git and you can think of it as kind of a combination between a cloud backup and a social network. Works by default backs up all of your local work into a remote repository like GitHub and the repository can be either private, just for your eyes and those of your collaborators, or public, which is useful if you want to use it as online supplementary materials for a paper. The reason I say that GitHub has social networking features is because it's possible to copy other people's repositories, which allows you to reproduce them or to conduct follow-up research building quite directly on their prior work. It is also possible to open an issue in somebody else's project, to ask a question or to give a comment about the work. And finally, if you are a collaborator or if you think you've spotted an error in someone else's repository, you can send suggested changes to the code or text using a pull request. And a pull request is basically a request for a project owner to consider your changes to their work. Another reason GitHub is useful for open science is because you can use it to tag specific states of your project. For example, the definition of a pre-registration is a public and indelible record of your research plans. Now, GitHub is such a public and indelible record of your entire project history. And if you have written a pre-registration and it is hosted in your public GitHub repository, it is sufficient to simply tag the current state of your project as pre-registration and this indelible record can always be easily found. Of course, if you want to be extra thorough, you can also upload that pre-registration to a dedicated service like the Open Science Framework or aspredicted.org. But that is not even strictly necessary. Your GitHub repository serves as an indelible record of your pre-registered plans. Using Git and GitHub is important because it gives you a complete backup of the entire project history. That means that you can always go back to a previous version, you can try new things, be experimental, and you never have to worry about losing your work. You can also prove to auditors that you have pre-registered your plans and followed them from A to Z, because people can see all of the steps in your project history. GitHub facilitates easy collaboration online, even with strangers. As a case in point, the works paper and our package were written publicly on GitHub. And the project attracted several additional collaborators before we went to publication. So when you start working in this way, you will find that there's a whole community of tech savvy, open science minded researchers out there and it can really help you expand your network. So just to sum up, GitHub can be your pre-registration, 
It can be your research archive, your supplementary materials, and even serve as a comment section for your published paper. It is also easy to connect GitHub to an Open Science Framework project page. The Open Science Framework is a well-known web service for open science related projects. You can create a new project for your research there and connect that project directly to your GitHub repository. If we think back to the FAIR principles of open science, then connecting your GitHub repository to the Open Science Framework improves the findability of your research. The Open Science Framework also allows you to get a DOI, a digital object identifier, for your project and even for specific resources within the project. You can also connect GitHub to Zenodo, which is a different service for improving the findability of research output. And there too, you can get a DOI and you can store a project snapshot, like a time capsule of your GitHub repository, which keeps it extra safe. Now, the final tool that works is based upon is dependency management. And the idea behind dependency management is this. In order to make your project reproducible, it is not enough to give people access to your data and your analysis code. They must also have access to the exact software environment that you used to run the code. Now for licensed software, this is very difficult. If you conduct your research in R, these dependencies are the R packages that you use. Now, anytime we try to ensure dependency management, there is a difficult trade-off. We can ensure strict reproducibility, but that means creating a time capsule, basically a virtual computer, that runs all of the same software that we use when we analyze the data. It is becoming increasingly user-friendly to do so, and if you are the PI of a research consortium, it is definitely worth considering this as a solution. But for smaller research projects and for individual researchers, this can be quite technical and difficult to set up. Now on the other side of the spectrum is not providing any information about dependency management, and this will lead to your results being non-reproducible. Works tries to strike a balance somewhere in the middle. That means that we try to make your project reproducible under most circumstances while requiring a minimum amount of effort and technical skill. To do so, we rely on the package rnv. rnv maintains a text-based list of all of the packages that you use, their version number, and where you installed them from. For example, if you installed them from CRAN, the central R repository, or from Bioconductor or from GitHub. Because it is a text-based list, you can version control this list with Git. And when a user loads your project, rnv automatically installs all of the packages described in that list. This is important because it's essential for reproducibility, but it's also good for collaboration because everybody who is working on your project will be using the same versions of all of the packages. So you never run into the problem that one person can't run the code created by someone else. And finally, using dependency management is just a way to be kind to your future self. With dependency management, you can be safe in knowing that when you open your project two years down the line, everything will work as predicted. Now, having introduced the three fundamental tools that Works is based upon, let me talk a little bit about the unique features contributed by the Works R package. If you install this R package, you will get a new RStudio template. If you work in RStudio, you can create a new project from this template and it will set up all of the requirements to make your project open and reproducible automatically. Furthermore, the works package facilitates integration with GitHub. During project creation, you provide a URL for a GitHub project. And then as you work on this research, you can just use the function git update with an informative descriptive message to commit all of your changes to the public online repository. One major exception to this are data files. You don't want to accidentally upload your data to GitHub without making an informed decision to do so. So by default, Works screens out all data related files. Works also includes several manuscript and pre-registration templates. 
For example, templates from the articles R package, Papaya, which is relevant for people who write APA style papers, and the Pre-Reg R package, which includes a lot of common pre-registration templates from the Open Science Framework, as predicted, etc. But Works also includes original pre-registration templates that cannot be found in other R packages, specifically for the analysis of secondary data and longitudinal data. And this is highly relevant for developmental scientists. Works also includes unique solutions for data sharing, for example, if you are not able to share the original data, and it contains functions that allow you to cite essential papers and non-essential papers, so that if an editor asks you to reduce the number of citations, you can remove all non-essential citations in one fell swoop. Finally, there's a works checklist that you can use to see whether your project lives up to the standards of openness and reproducibility. And there is an automatic check that will give you a badge if your paper does live up to those standards. And the badge will be publicly displayed on your GitHub page. If you meet all of the requirements of open science, the badge will be green and otherwise it will be orange or red. Now I mentioned that Works has some unique solutions for data sharing. A common dilemma is that in order to make your research fully reproducible, you would have to share your data. But some data is privacy sensitive, for example, children's data or data about veterans or mental health patients. Now, if you have a data set that can be shared without reservation, for example, a data set in meta-analysis, there are no privacy concerns, then you can use the works function open data. This function simply adds your data to the GitHub repository and uploads it. The default file format is CSV, that is a text-based format that can be read by humans and by machines without needing any licensed software to open it but you can use other custom save or load functions for your data if necessary. Now, if you do have privacy sensitive data, you can use the function closed data. This function saves your original data locally, only on your computer. Then it creates a synthetic data file with similar properties to the original, but because it doesn't contain any real data, it is no longer privacy sensitive then it makes these synthetic data public, and by default that would also be a CSV file. As a final step, closed data creates a unique identifying number for the original data. You can think of this as a passport that will only match your unique data set. This number is also made public, and it's useful because if there were ever any question about the reproducibility of your results, people could verify that the public unique ID corresponds to the ID of the data that you used to run your analyses. Now, when it comes to loading data, you can use the function load data. This function checks if the original data are present on your own computer, and if so, it loads those data into memory. And if the original data are not present, then it loads the synthetic data. That means that scripts that start with load data can always be reproduced. And people can create a working script using the synthetic data and then send that script to you and it will just work on your original data. And you can send the requested results back to them. This is useful, for example, if you get a request to compute some alternative analyses or to give some summary statistics for a meta-analysis. They can just submit the code that computes whatever they need. You run it locally and you send them the results. It is worth emphasizing that even though the default file type in Works is a text-based CSV file, you can actually use custom save and load functions, and those are recorded in the Works file, which keeps all of the project settings. I'm sure some of you are asking by this point, what if I'm not an R user? First of all, I wanna thank you for being so patient while I expound the advantages of the R-based workflow. And let me tell you a little bit about the ways in which Works can benefit you, even if you're not an R user. First of all, the Works paper, published in Data Science, addresses the conceptual workflow in a platform-agnostic manner. 
That means that it covers issues and decisions that you will have to consider anyway if you want to work in an open and reproducible way, regardless of the software you use to do so. Second of all, the only reason that Works is currently implemented in R is because all of the authors are R users. But it would be possible to implement these principles in, for example, Python or Jupyter. And we are actively looking for a collaborator who wants to make that happen. Third of all, I think that Works is actually a really good starting point for getting into R. And the reason is that we've written a setup tutorial based on the experience of teaching introductory R courses. And this setup tutorial will make sure that you have everything correctly installed on your system. Moreover, any tricky issues, for example, project management in RStudio and using Git and using R Markdown, they are partially automated when you use the Works template. So it's easier to get started with more complex issues when you use Works. And finally, Works allows you to learn good habits from the start, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you don't have to experience such a steep learning curve. Here is a visual summary of the process of writing a paper using works. We distinguish three phases. The first phase is study design. The second phase is writing and analysis. And the third phase is submission or publication. In phase one, the very first thing that you do is to make a new repository on GitHub. Then you create a new RStudio project from the works template and you paste the GitHub address in the project creation dialog window. The new project automatically starts managing your dependencies and adds a pre-registration template if you asked for one. You can also add your open materials to the project if you have any. Now, if you added a pre-registration, after writing it, you could tag the pre-registration on GitHub and you can additionally upload the pre-registration to a dedicated repository. Then you enter the writing and analysis phase. As soon as you've collected data, you can add them to the repository using open data or closed data. When you created the project, a template manuscript was added, and now you can start writing that manuscript, citing essential references with a single add symbol and non-essential references with a double add symbol. Your analysis script is interleaved with an R Markdown manuscript. Now, while you are working on all of these files, you should regularly commit changes and push them to GitHub using the git update function. Finally, when your project nears completion, you can snapshot your dependencies. You can run an automatic check to get a works badge for open science practices. And you can render your R Markdown to a PDF, which you can then submit to a journal and I would encourage you to host it on a preprint server, like SciArchive. That means that people can comment on your manuscript before it is even published, and that people from universities who don't have access to paywalled articles can also read your work. I would also highly encourage you to connect your GitHub project to the Open Science Framework, and to get a DOI, a stable online identifier, to make this project findable. That concludes my introduction about Works. I hope that I was able to show you how Works can help you make your research more open and reproducible. If you want to find out more, please go to developmentaldatascience.org forward slash works. There you can find different introductory videos and published materials about the workflow. Thank you very much.